Chapter 27 Killer Bull The year was 1945. The devastating war in Europe was grinding to its end, with the German army being squeezed hard from two sides by the Allied forces. In January of 1945, the Russian army led by General Zhukov pierced into the Oder River just 40 miles east of Berlin. Soon after, the Russian mechanized divisions gummed to a halt in a bog of spring mud and stiff German resistance. At the same time, the Western Allies were making good progress through France and Belgium, with the Americans having penetrated farthest into the German-held territory. Early in March, General Patton's Third Army reached the Rhine River at Koblenz. A few days later, General Hodges' First Army seized a bridge farther downstream at Ramagen. The American generals longed to keep going so that they could beat the Russians to Berlin, but they were ordered to wait for General Montgomery's 25 British divisions to catch up. By April 25th, the Russians had not only encircled Berlin, but they had also met up with the American forces on the Elbe River, 45 miles to the west. At the same time, German defenses in Italy collapsed, allowing the Western Allies to advance rapidly north up the Italian boot. On April 28th, the Italian dictator Benito Mussolini was caught and executed by his own people as he tried to flee from the advancing Allies. Fascism now lay dead as a world political force, and Nazism was breathing its last. Communism, on the other hand, was kicking and stretching and gobbling up everything within reach. As communists and Nazis battled in the streets of Berlin, Hitler appointed one of his aides, Karl Donitz, as the head of the German state. Then on April 30th, Adolf Hitler quietly disappeared from the face of the earth. Donitz immediately began the process of unilateral surrender, which was officially completed on May 8, 1945. The war in Europe was over. In the face of these momentous world events, William Branham could only watch and marvel, for they meant that of the seven visions of the future that he had seen in a row on that June morning in 1933, three of them had now happened. Mussolini had died in disgrace, Hitler had come to a mysterious end, and communism was growing stronger as a dominant political force. No doubt the other four visions would follow in God's own time. This gave Bill a reason to be optimistic about his personal future. Surely the Lord must have a specific purpose for his life, or why else would the Almighty bestow on him such an unusual gift? Bill needed all the fuel he could to keep the small fire of his optimism burning, because in the natural, he could see no way that he could ever dig himself out of his poverty far enough to accomplish anything great for the kingdom of God. He still worked his three jobs, two without pay. Even though he always seemed short of cash, he never considered taking any money for his services as pastor. He had several reasons for this. First, from reading his Bible and from watching ministers around him, he recognized early in his ministry that the love of money could be one of the deadliest traps a minister would ever face, and Bill intended to avoid it. Second, although some members of his congregation were making as much as $3 an hour, most members were as poor as or poorer than he was and Bill could not bring himself to ask these poor people to sacrifice any more than they already were. He did preach the biblical principle of tithing, and every member put a tenth of their income into a box kept in the back of the church, specifically for that purpose. But Bill didn't use a penny of this money for himself. It all went towards the monthly loan payments, which just barely left enough over for upkeep on the building. His third reason carried a touch of pride and self-reliance. Since he was strong and able to work, he thought, why not work? One payday afternoon, Bill and Mita budgeted out his weekly $28 paycheck from his job at Public Service Indiana. His own tithes came out first. Then Mita pointed out the bills that absolutely had to have a payment. No matter how they divided their remaining $25.20, they simply could not make it cover all their immediate obligations. They lacked about $10. Bill held up a letter and said, Honey, we can't even start to pay this one. 
But we've got to pay it, she said. Oh, Bill, what are we going to do? Bill had an idea. You know what? Tonight at church, I'm going to take up an offering. Mita's initial surprise melted into amusement. I'm going to enjoy watching you try. That night, after the song service and before he preached, Bill said, All right, friends. Tonight, I hate to ask you this. Mita gave him a comical look, knowing how uncomfortable he felt. Bill tried to keep from looking at her as he stumbled around for words. I never did this before. It's these hard times, you know, and can't hardly make ends meet. If you've all got a nickel or dime you would like to drop in my hat as it's passed around, Brother Wiseheart, would you come in and take my hat? Deacon Wiseheart came forward looking as puzzled as everyone else, not because he didn't love his pastor. He did. They all did. They were certainly willing to help Bill in any way they could. They were surprised because in the past twelve years this had never happened before. Brother Wiseheart passed the hat down along the first pew. Bill watched as Mrs. Weber reached down in a pocket on her checkered apron and pulled out a little snap top coin purse. When she fished out a nickel, Bill's heart sank like a lead weight on a fishing line dropping into the muck at the bottom of the pond. He knew these were tough times for almost everyone, not just him. He couldn't do it. Wait a minute, Sister Weber. You don't need to put that nickel in there. I didn't really mean it. I was just teasing you all to see what you would do. Now, old Deacon Wiseheart felt more perplexed than ever. He asked, Brother Branham, what should I do? Just put my hat back, Brother Wiseheart. I'm going on with the service. Mita covered her mouth with her hand and shook her head. Bill could tell by her eyes that she was laughing. John Ryan, Bill's old friend from up north, had been in Jeffersonville that week visiting around. This gutsy old man had pedaled a beat up bicycle all the way from Michigan, some 250 miles. But the bicycle had given him so much trouble along the way, he decided to abandon it and hitchhike back home. With characteristic generosity, John Ryan gave the bicycle to Bill, who promptly repaired it and spruced it up with a 10 cent can of paint. Bill didn't really need a bicycle himself, but he thought he might be able to sell it to get the extra money he needed. Bill's second unpaid job, that of Indiana State Game Warden, coincided so closely with his work at the public service company that he rarely considered it an extra effort. That was fortunate because his work as a linesman was strenuous enough for two jobs. One of his main tasks for Public Service Indiana was patrolling the high voltage transmission lines that stretched for hundreds of miles through the rugged Indiana backwoods. Much of this distance had no roads nearby, so Bill often found himself on foot, hiking 30 miles a day, six days a week, all for just 60 cents an hour. Still, there were other rewards besides money. The job got him out of town and into the wilderness that he loved. Occasionally, through his capacity as game warden, he could help a poacher reform and so protect the local wildlife. Then, too, he would always stop and chat with farmers working in their fields. Invariably, the subject came around to God, and Bill would get a chance to share with them the love of Jesus Christ. Sometimes a farmer would mellow and give his heart to Jesus. Immediately, Bill would take him down to the nearest creek and baptize him in the name of the Lord. With clothes dripping wet, the two would part company, both of them rejoicing as they went back to their respective tasks. One afternoon, Bill was up near Henryville, Indiana, releasing some fish into a creek for the fish and game department. He was close to the farm of a friend who was sick, so Bill thought it would be nice if he stopped in and prayed for the man. Since the farm was just across a few fences, Bill didn't bother driving around on the roads. Unbuckling his holster, he tossed his gun into the front seat of his truck, shut the door, and climbed the first fence, forgetting that there was a sign on each corner of the pasture warning, Danger, beware of bull. Bill hummed a Christian hymn as he strolled across the grassy field. In the middle of the pasture stood a small patch of scrub oaks. Spindly little trees averaging ten feet high. 
Bill was approaching these when suddenly the huge bull stood up and snorted. It had been lying quietly in the shade of the gnarled oak branches, out of sight until just then. Instantly, Bill recognized his peril, for this particular Guernsey bull had a far-flung reputation. It had been a prize breeder on the Burke farm near Jeffersonville, but had always displayed an ornery temper and finally had gored its caretaker to death, forcing its owner to get rid of it. Since it was such a prize bull, Burke had sold it to this man up at Henryville, hoping that the isolated countryside would allow it no more opportunities for mischief. Bill had known about this, but it had just slipped his mind. Now he desperately sized up his chances. The scrub oaks were too flimsy and in the wrong direction. The fences were too far away. That left his gun. He might have to shoot the animal and then pay the farmer for his loss. The killer bull dropped its head, snorted, and pawed the ground. Its long pointed horns did indeed look like lethal weapons. Bill reached for his gun. It wasn't there. Then he remembered he left his holster on the seat of his truck. Well, Lord, if the time has come for me to die, I want to face it like a man. He straightened his shoulders and looked coolly at his foe. At that moment, something incredible happened inside of him. His fear evaporated, replaced by a love born of sympathy and understanding unlike anything he had ever experienced before. He thought, That poor bull was lying out there in the field, and I came along and disturbed him. He doesn't know anything different than to protect himself. The bull snorted harder and faster, scraping the ground with its hoof, throwing dirt behind it as bulls do before a charge. Bill said out loud, Bull, I'm sorry that I disturbed you. I don't want you to kill me. I'm a servant of God, and I'm on my way to pray for a sick man. I forgot about those signs. The bull charged, head down, with its curved horns pointed dead on target. Amazingly, Bill felt absolutely no fear, only love. He said, In the name of Jesus Christ, go over and lay down under those trees. The bull continued charging with all its muscle and fury. When it was only ten feet away, it threw out its front legs and stopped in a cloud of dust. The strangest expression crossed its face as it swung its head to the right and back to the left. Then the animal turned around and showed Bill its tail. It walked slowly back to the scrub oaks, lay down, and watched as Bill strode the rest of the way across the pasture. For the rest of that day, and many other days, Bill marveled at what had happened in that pasture between him and that bull. In the face of almost certain death, he had somehow stepped beyond his own concerns to feel the heartbeat of another life. Somehow he had understood the bull's agitation and had sympathized with the animal. As a pastor, he often extended himself to others, caring and helping wherever he could. But this experience was something different something deeper. For a few minutes in his life, all fear had vanished, and he had felt perfect love. About this time, Bill learned that a neighbor of his, Mrs. Reed, who lived on the end of his block, was dying with tuberculosis. She had been moved over to the sanatorium in Louisville to protect her four small children from the highly contagious disease. Because tuberculosis was that demon that had killed Hope, Bill felt a deep burden for Mrs. Reed. He just couldn't get her off his mind. Such a young mother, suffering so much and having to leave those needy little children. One night, Bill drove over to the sanatorium and prayed for her. Two days later, while Bill was sitting on his front porch, the Lord showed him a vision of Mrs. Reed as a gray-haired grandmother shaking hands with her adult children. Bill went back to the sanatorium and told her, Thus saith the Lord, you're going to live. Mrs. Reed cried out, Oh, thanks be to God. Bill asked, Will you rise and be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, calling upon him to wash away your sins? She answered, I'll do anything that God bids me to do. A few days later, Bill was out on the sidewalk in front of his house, getting ready to ride his newly acquired bicycle to the grocery store.
He had just swung his leg over the center bar and was about to push off when his next-door neighbor called to him. Say, wait a minute there, preacher. Where are you going? Good morning, Mr. Andrews. I'm heading over to the grocery store. Can I bring something back for you? Nah, I just wanted to ask you something. His voice took on a scolding tone. Aren't you ashamed of yourself? What do you mean? Telling that poor dying mother that she is going to live and giving her family false hopes. Now Bill understood what this was all about. Mr. Andrews was a decent neighbor most of the time, but he had always been insolent toward Bill's faith in God. Mr. Andrews worked with Mr. Reed at the government depot and must have heard about the vision from him. Well, Mr. Andrews, she is going to live, Bill insisted. Thousands of people die from tuberculosis every year. What makes you think Mrs. Reed is going to live? Bill gave the only explanation he could, because Jesus said so. He showed me a vision of it. Mr. Andrews snorted his disgust. I would be ashamed of myself if I were you, going around and deceiving people like that. I know I'm being kind of hard on you, but that's all right, Mr. Andrews. You've got your ideas and I've got mine. Bill got on his bicycle and rode away. Meanwhile, Mrs. Reed's condition improved so remarkably that her doctors wanted to x-ray her lungs again. To their amazement, they could find no trace of the disease in her body. There was no longer any reason to keep her in the sanatorium. With great joy and fanfare, she returned home to her family. Two days later, Mita said, Billy, I found out today that Mrs. Andrews is very sick. You ought to go over and see her. All right, I'll go, but I'll have to walk easy around her husband. He doesn't think a whole lot of me. Bill went next door and knocked. Mr. Andrews opened the door. Hello, Mr. Andrews. I hear your wife is sick. Could I do something for you? Look here, said his neighbor gruffly. We've got a good doctor, and we don't need any help from you. She just has appendicitis. We'll have it taken out, and that will take care of her. We don't need any prayer around here. Mr. Andrews, I didn't ask if I could pray for your wife. I just wanted to offer my help. I could bring you some supper or run an errand for groceries or anything else I could do to help. Thank you, but no thank you, said Mr. Andrews insolently. Everything is under control. I certainly hope so, said Bill. If I can be of any help, just let me know. His neighbor grunted and shut the door. The next morning, Bill went to work as usual, patrolling the high lines for the public service company. He got out of his truck, strapped on his game warden gun belt, and walked up the road. He'd not gone far when he felt strongly impressed to turn around and go back home. Rain drizzled from a slate gray sky, but not enough to stop him from working, so he shook off the urge and continued walking. The impression came back again, more demanding than before. Bill returned to his truck and radioed his foreman that he wouldn't be working that day. Then he drove home. It surprised me to see her husband walk through the door in the middle of the morning. What are you doing back? I don't know exactly. The Lord told me to come back. So I did. He laid his gun down on the kitchen table, took it apart and started to oil and shine the pieces. Through the window he saw Mr. Andrews coming around the side of the house. In a few moments, he knocked on the door and called out, Mrs. Branham, is the preacher here? Mita, working at the kitchen counter, wiped her hands on her apron and said, Yes, come in, Mr. Andrews. Their neighbor stepped through the kitchen door looking like a whipped dog. His eyes were puffy and red, his nose dripped mucus, and his hat sat twisted, crooked on his head. Hello, preacher, he said contritely. Hello, Mr. Andrews, have a chair. Mr. Andrews sat down next to Bill. Emotional turmoil showed on every line of his face. Have you heard about Mrs. Andrews? Well, I know what's wrong. Well, preacher, his voice quivered, she's going to die. I'm sorry to hear that, Mr. Andrews, although I know you've got a good doctor. Yes, he said, blowing his nose, but it wasn't appendicitis after all. 
It turns out it's a blood clot and it's just a couple of hours from her heart. We've got a specialist from Louisville at the hospital now. He says that when the blood clot reaches her heart, she's going to die. My, that's too bad, said Bill. I hate to hear that, but I'm glad you've got a good doctor on the case. Mr. Andrews stuttered and struggled for his next words. Um, well, um, she's very bad, see, and, uh, I was wondering if, er, do you reckon you could help her? Me? Bill spread his hand across his chest. I'm not a doctor. How would I know what to do? Well, uh, you know, I thought maybe you could help her a little like you did the woman down in the corner, Mrs. Reed. That wasn't me, Bill explained. That was the Lord Jesus who helped Mrs. Reed. I thought you didn't believe in him. Mr. Andrews shrugged. You know, one of my aunts was a Christian who lived out in the hills. One time she made a promise to God to pay a circuit preacher five dollars at the end of the year. She washed other people's clothes trying to save up the money. But as the end of the year approached, she just didn't have it. The day before the preacher came, she bought a new bar of soap for a nickel. She was standing over the wash tub, crying because she couldn't keep her promise. She dried her tears on her apron, then stuck her hands down in the water and rubbed the bar of soap with the washboard to raise up a lather. The soap made a funny clinking sound. When she looked closer, she found a five dollar gold piece sticking in that bar of soap. So she was able to keep her promise to God after all. How did that gold piece get there? asked Bill, although he knew the answer. Mr. Andrews shook his head. I don't know. I've often wondered that myself. I'll tell you how. The resurrected Jesus did that. The woman made her promise in good faith from a pure heart. She thought she could do it. God simply made a way for her to keep her promise. Mr. Andrews nodded. I've thought about that. It's even made me wonder if there is a God. Mr. Andrews, there is a God. The man bowed his head. Do you think he could help my wife? Sure, I know he can. Will you pray for her? Mr. Andrews begged. First things first, you need to get your own heart right. How about kneeling here with me and we'll pray together? Well, I, I don't hardly know what to say. I'll help you. So they pushed their chairs back from the table and kneeling rested their elbows on the seats of their chairs. Bill instructed, From the bottom of your heart say, God be merciful to me a sinner. They continued praying until that hardened atheist wept his way to faith in Jesus Christ. Then Mr. Andrews wiped his eyes and asked, Well, preacher, will you go to the hospital now? Yes, I'll go. Mita went with him. By the time they entered the hospital room, Mrs. Andrews was so bad there was no color left in her eyes. Her face was so swollen she barely looked like the same person who had lived next door to them for many years. Mita wept at the sight of her. Bill knelt by the bed and prayed. Dear God, please help Mrs. Andrews. We're all helpless. The doctor has done all he can do, and still she's dying. Jesus, We know that you rose from the dead and are alive among us with the power to do anything. We ask you to have mercy on this poor woman and let her live. Bill stood there a while holding Mrs. Andrew's swollen hand. Mita asked, See anything? No, honey, I don't. They walked out of the room and down the hall to the maternity ward to look at the newborn babies through the window. Then they walked back to Mrs. Andrew's room. Just as Bill stepped across the threshold, he saw Mrs. Andrews in her own kitchen taking an apple pie out of her oven. Then Bill saw himself sitting on the front porch of his own house. Mrs. Andrews came around the edge of the house and offered him the whole pie. After carving that pie into pieces, Bill dug out a wedge and ate it. Then as quickly as he had gone, he was back in the hospital room. He turned to Mita and said, Honey, it's going to be all right. Don't worry. God has heard our prayers. A nurse overheard his comment and she asked, Reverend Branham, what do you mean? Bill explained, 
Mrs. Andrews will bake me a pie three days from now. If that isn't so, then I'll leave the ministry. Returning to Mr. Andrews' house, Bill told him, Thus saith the Lord, Your wife is going to be all right. Don't worry, Mr. Andrews. How can you be sure? God has said so by the same vision that told Mrs. Reed that she was going to live, and she's home and feeling fine. But Bill didn't mention the part about the apple pie. Bill and Mita went home. Two hours later, Mr. Andrews knocked on Bill's door again. Preacher, the doctor says she's dying right now. She's got death rattles in her throat. But the Lord Jesus said she's going to live, Bill answered, trying to reassure him. Don't you believe what I told you? Well, preacher, I want to, but the doctors say she can't survive another hour. It doesn't make a bit of difference what the doctors say. When God speaks, it's got to happen. Nervous and not a bit confident, Mr. Andrews left for the hospital. Mita, remembering how terrible Mrs. Andrews had looked, asked her husband, Bill, what do you really think? Why, don't worry about it. God has said so, and that settles it. That woman will bake me an apple pie three days from now, and I'll be sitting out on the porch when I eat the first piece. If it doesn't happen, then God is not speaking to me. Within the hour, Mr. Andrews came back all excited and shouting, Preacher, do you know what happened? Bill had just gotten around to putting the pieces of his revolver back together. He spun the cylinder, clicked it shut, and slipped the gun into its holster. What happened, Mr. Andrews? All the water passed from her. She raised up in bed and said, I'm starving to death. When one of the nurses brought her some chicken bouillon, she said, I don't want bouillon. I want wieners and sauerkraut. Preacher, they said I can take her home in a couple of days. Three days after that, while Bill was sitting on his front porch, Mrs. Andrews came around the corner of the house, pie in hand. Bill propped his feet up and enjoyed the nicest piece of apple pie he ever ate. The next day, Bill sold his refurbished bicycle for $10, which was just enough money to meet his credit obligation for the month. He knew the Lord was taking care of him.